Lord, church, why don't we stand? And why don't we put our hands together and let's open this service tonight with praise to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Is anybody thankful to be serving a God who is not, he is alive, he is not dead. He is alive and he has given us strength inside of our bodies tonight. We thank you for your resurrecting power of your spirit, Jesus. We give you praise tonight, Lord. You're a mighty God. You're a mighty God. You deserve our praise. You deserve our praise, Jesus. You've given us the victory, and so we thank you, Lord. We praise you tonight, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> him up this evening. He's worthy. God, you're mighty. Hallelujah. 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 God, you're worthy. God, you're worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord on Sunday night. Why don't you turn to your neighbor? If you're sitting by one, say, it's good to see you in church on a Sunday night. Amen. 
the elders of the church would get ready. We're going to go into a season of prayer. Amen. If you have a sickness in your body, maybe it's a financial need, or if you just need it, you have a need that you need God to step on the scene. Amen. We're going to invite you to come to the front. There's a lot of people that have been out fighting sickness. There seems to be some bugs going around, but we know a God that's able to heal, that's able to save, that's able to raise up. And uh, if you have family members that are lost, um, I was thinking about this earlier today. I have an individual in my life that God's placed back in my heart, a family member that I hadn't thought about in a while. But I know a God that's able to reach into their life. It seems hopeless in the natural sense, but I know that there's a God that can reach into hopeless situations, into impossibilities. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If you have a family member, maybe they've been wayward for a while, maybe you've not brought them before the Lord, but you want to step out in faith and say, God, I know you're still able to reach in and you want to bridge the gap tonight by faith. I believe that God from this service tonight can reach his arm of mercy, can reach wherever they're at. He can dispatch an angel or send somebody their way. How many believe that God's able tonight? Amen. If you have an unspoken request, you can make it known by the lifting of your hand. Amen. Let's remember to pray for one another. Why don't we pray this evening? Jesus, we love you. Thank you for your presence that's in this place. Thank you, God, for your goodness to us, Jesus. You see every need, God, everyone that stepped out by faith, Jesus. Whatever the situation is, you're the healer. God, you're our way maker. God, you're our provider, Jesus. There's nothing too large or too small, but God, you're able. Jesus, you see our lost loved ones. God, those that are wayward right now, God, that are destitute, God, that are on their way to hell, God, you're able to reach in and to save. God, to draw them this evening, God, to send an angel, Jesus. God, or somebody their way, Jesus, would you do a work in their lives this evening? God, every unspoken request, every hand that was lifted, God, you see the need, Jesus, you're able to do above and beyond anything we could ask or think. Why don't we begin to lift up the name of Jesus? Come on with your voice. Let's begin to thank him, Jesus. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for what you're doing. You've already been doing, God. You're good to us. We give you praise and glory and honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. We worship you.
are closed. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you, God. It's not about us, Lord. It's not about the things that we have done in our past, Lord. It's all under your blood because you're the one. You became sin. He who knew no sin, you became sin for us, God. You went to Calvary and you died upon that cross, oh God. And you resurrected with all power that we would walk in newness of life tonight. So we give you thanks, Jesus. We give you praise, God. We give you glory tonight, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us, God. We thank you for the blood that washes away our sins, Lord. We thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you. We are so undeserving, God, but your grace and your mercy extends toward us. Why don't you put your hands together all across this house and let's thank him. Thank you, Jesus. thankful for the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Scripture says that the blessing of the Lord maketh fat. I see Brother John over there patting his belly. And I don't think that's exactly what it means, but how many have experienced the goodness and the mercy and the blessing of God just overtaking you in your life? Amen. I'm so thankful for all of his goodness and blessing. Amen. Let's read our scripture together. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Let's bring it cheerfully this evening. Put your hands together tonight.
we can. Hallelujah! I've got breath inside of my lungs today. Take that devil. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Why don't you high five about 500 people on your way to your seat and tell them I've got no reason to fear. worship you Jesus we praise your name Jesus oh hallelujah hallelujah amen welcome to the house of the Lord on this beautiful fall I think it's supposed to be fall but it's staying warm as long as it can this beautiful evening and what a joy it is to see all of you uh, please if when you when it crosses your mind in fact why don't we just do it right now Bishop is at home and he texted me, and he's not feeling well. He said he wanted to be here, but he's just not feeling well. I know he's been fighting it all day, and he pushed through it this morning, and then he texted me, well, actually called me a little bit earlier and said he would not be able to make it tonight. And for Bishop to not be at church, he must not be feeling well. So before we go any further, why don't we just stop? And you may know of someone else that's sick that, that I don't know of, and why don't you mention their name as well? Why don't we pray, Jesus, we ask right now that you would step into this room where Bishop is and anyone else that wants to be here, God, and they can't because of sickness. We ask that your healing virtue would flow out of this house to wherever they may be right now, God, that your healing virtue would touch their bodies, that you would rebuke this sickness, that you would remove it from their body as a testament of your glory that you are still a God that can heal of any sickness. We give you all the glory and all the praise. And everyone said in Jesus' name, amen. If you would open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 9 and verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. Many of us could probably quote this. If you can't quote it, that's okay. You can memorize it before the night's over, and then the next time somebody preaches about this, you can quote it too. It's not a super difficult verse to learn. And I am going to grasp one, really one phrase out of this. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, if you have it, say amen. amen. The Bible reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. The government shall be upon his shoulder. And with the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to preach on this subject, or this title, The Cost of a Kingdom. The Cost of a Kingdom. Could you lay your Bibles down and let's pray together. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for this time together. Jesus, in the next few minutes, would you speak to each of us? Would you speak into our hearts and our minds? Would you give us strength for this week, God? Would you draw us closer to you, Jesus? Above all, have your way. Give us ears to hear. Give us a mind to understand, God. Give us a heart to receive. 
Give us hands and feet to obey it. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture, a very familiar verse uh, from the book of Isaiah. Every book of the Bible seems to have its own familiar or famous passages that stand out beyond just the whole of that book. Isaiah has a lot of them. Isaiah is known as the Messianic prophet. He prophesies much of the Messiah. This verse is prophetic of the Messiah that would come and deliver Israel. Isaiah is a fascinating book. There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. Most scholars divide the book of Isaiah into two parts. They divide it in, in two halves, if you will. And the first half, they divide. Anybody want to guess in how many chapters they divide it at? 39. And there's 39 books in the Old Testament. They divide the second half with, obviously, what's left, 27. There's 27 books in the New Testament. There is a clear shift at chapter 40 in the prophecies of Isaiah. It is such a stark shift in his prophecies that some believe that it is actually two authors. I don't believe that. I believe the prophet Isaiah prophesied the entire book. But there is such a drastic shift from chapter 39 to chapter 40 that some say the only way that could happen is if it was a different prophet. We know the Bible is inspired completely by God and he can change the tone of how he wants to talk pretty much whenever he wants to change the tone of how he's talking. So more than likely, that's what actually happened from chapter 39 to chapter 40. But in this verse, in this little verse that gets quoted so often, and it gets quoted a lot around Christmas time, which we're getting close to Christmas. I believe there are 10 Saturdays before Christmas or 9, if you were wondering. Can't remember off the top of my head. In fact, just for Sister Jess, I wore Christmas socks today. They have presents and wreaths all over them. I, well, I don't know if it's a Christmas tie. It just has dogs on it. My shirt has nutcrackers on it. I am in full Christmas mode. And the closer we get, the more I get into Christmas mode. And, you know, it's just, I'm in love with my Messiah, and I celebrate when he came. <laughs> Uh, so, now if you don't, if you don't get in, you know, if, if Christmas isn't your thing, that's fine. I'm sure you still love your Messiah too. Just having a little bit of fun. But in this verse, there is something very interesting. I will admit to you, I never noticed until today. And that's what we're going to uh, spring off of. We're going to spring off of this specific word. In our subject tonight, and we'll see what the Holy Ghost will do by the end of this service. So we read, for unto us a child is born. We know this is speaking of the Messiah. Jesus, who's born in Bethlehem, somewhere around 2 B.C., I believe, is when they actually put his birth somewhere around there. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's interesting to me because most of us have two shoulders, plural, yet this word is singular. So I begin to dig a little bit. What is this word? And this word, first, the word government can be clearly translated as kingdom. So, and the kingdom will be upon his 
shoulder. But the word also lends itself to the idea of back. In fact, quite literally, shoulder blades. So the kingdom will be upon his back. Or it will be born upon his back. Keep that in mind as we work through the next few passages of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, there is a fascinating account that takes place. We learn from Matthew the sum or probably the biggest, the most in-depth view of this account between Jesus and a young man. We learn in Mark that Jesus loves this young man very much. We learn in Luke that this young man is a ruler. And so we call this account the rich young ruler. He comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus, verse 16, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You can also read this in Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 19. And in Mark, I believe it's in Mark, Jesus tells him to come, take up your cross and follow me. This is a fascinating passage of scripture because you actually have two rulers talking to each other. You have Jesus who is the king of eternity. He is king of kings. He is lord of lords. And he is actively doing what he is asking the rich young ruler to do. He has left his throne. He has left all of the splendor of heaven and has become a man to save the world. While he looks at this rich young ruler and says, go give up your kingdom, take up your cross, and follow me. This is one of the few places where God clearly calls an individual. I don't know if it was to be another of the apostles. I don't, we don't know. There's all kinds of conjecture that can go into this. We don't know what would have happened with this rich young ruler. We know that Jesus is on his way to be crucified. The cross is definitely on the mind of Jesus. And that's why he tells this rich young ruler, sell everything you have, give to the poor, take up your cross, and follow after me. So, While you have to dig beneath the surface to see this, you actually have two rulers talking to each other. One who is doing what he's asking the other to do, and the other one unwilling to do what is asked of him because he is in love with the world. He is in love with the things that he has. It's not that he didn't love God. He did love God. 
He was able to look at Jesus with a clear conscience and say, the six commandments that you just said to me, I have kept from my youth. I understand many of us in this room, hopefully all of us, if not all of us, then hopefully it was in your present life, but hopefully all of us can, your life before Christ, not like you were reincarnated. Let's clarify that. In your life before Christ, this may have happened. But hopefully all of us in this room can say, I have never murdered someone. That's what Jesus said. Thou shalt not commit murder. In another place, he says, thou shalt not kill. He's quoting from the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Honor your father and your mother. Okay, can I say, can you say, can we say that from our youth, We have always, 100% of the time, honored our father and our mother. I don't think I could honestly say that. I could honestly say I have strived to honor my father and my mother. This young man said, I've done this from my youth. I've kept this from my youth. It's clear he loved God. It's clear he was devout in his Judaism and his keeping of the law of Moses. So, His love for God is not in question here. The question is, does he love God more than he loves his kingdom? Whatever he was ruler of. And he goes away sorrowful. Because he loved that more than this call to take up his cross and follow after Jesus. While Jesus is actively purchasing a kingdom. He's given up all the splendor. Remember, I haven't strayed away from our text. The government shall be upon his shoulders, or the government will be born upon his back. And Jesus is getting ready to pay the ultimate price to purchase a kingdom, to purchase a people, and it will be born upon his back. The cross. The cross will be born upon his back. You can go further. The stripes will be born upon his back. But the ultimate price was the cross. And so you have this very intriguing account. What would have happened to the young man? We don't know. But we do know he couldn't pay the price That it took to buy into this kingdom. Not because of love. But not because of love for God. But because he loved something more than he loved God. Then you have just a few chapters before this. You have Jesus talking about the kingdom. He says this. Matthew 13 verse 44. He gives us. This little nugget about the kingdom. He says again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buyeth that field. There's a lot that you can unpack out of. When Jesus tells parables, there's so much that's packed into a few words that you can go many different ways with this parable. But one of the things that is going on while Jesus is saying that is he is buying the treasure in the field. One of the ways this is interpreted, yes, I understand you are the person that finds the treasure in the field. And I am the person that finds the treasure in the field. But the first person to find the treasure in the field is Jesus. And that treasure was you. You are that treasure. You're the treasure that Jesus found in the field. Regardless of what the enemy tries to tell you, that you're worthless, that you don't matter, that nobody cares about you, that nobody notices you. He'll do anything he can to get in your head, to devalue you. But when it comes down to it, you are the treasure that was hid in the field. And Jesus exchanged all to purchase you and we'll we'll read this again later on but just let me quote it now the apostle paul said to feed the flock of god which he has purchased with his own blood jesus paid an ultimate price to purchase you 
He prayed, greater love hath no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friend. Jesus went to Calvary to save you. Jesus went to Calvary to buy the deed to you, to own the rights to bring you out of sin. So every time the devil gets in your mind and tells you you're worthless, that's a lie. Every time the devil gets in your mind and tells you you don't matter, that's a lie. The king of kings, the Lord of lords became flesh and blood to die to purchase you. Oh, if you're thankful for that, why don't we clap our hands together tonight? And so Jesus tells us this while he's doing this, that the kingdom of God is like a man who finds a treasure in a field and he's willing to sell all. And now we're brought back. And the, the Bible works in such a wonderful way. This, all the things that you need are told you before you get there. This is a great example. Jesus tells you what the kingdom of God is like. Then he gets to the account of the rich young ruler. And you see it happen right in front of you where he says, okay, the kingdom of God is a treasure hid in the field. You got to sell everything you have and go buy it. That's what he says. Then he moves on. And just a few days later, relatively speaking, just a few days later, he actually lets you see that play out in someone's life where he says, okay, you want eternal life. If you want to be perfect, you're lacking one thing. Go sell everything you have, give to the poor, take up your cross, and follow me. He's asking that young man to do that verse. Sell all that you have. Buy the treasure in the field. And in fact, Jesus was not asking the young man to do anything that he was not already doing. He was already actively purchasing the field himself. He was purchasing you and I through the ultimate act at Calvary. We could turn now to Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> While you're turning there, I want to ask you the same question that God asked me. That he's asked really all Christians. Why the cross? Why the cross? Why not? An X, why not? A triangle, why not? Why not the star of David? Why a cross? I don't claim to have all the answers to that question, but I do know at the founding of Christianity, the cross was one of the most hated, degenerate symbols of the world. It was one of the most vulgar emblems of the Roman world. We don't think that way today because of Christianity. You see the cross now and it's a sign of, of something that's holy, something that's sacred, something that's precious, something of great value. But not in Jesus' day. Cicero, he's one of the greatest Roman orators to live in the Roman Empire he lived before Jesus' crucifixion, I believe. It may be right after. But anyway, you can look him up later. His name's, if you type in Cicero, it'll give you all the details. But this is what Cicero said about the cross. Remember, this is one of the greatest orders of the Roman Senate, of the Roman government. He says this, Wretched is the loss of one's good. Wretched is the loss of, one good, of one's good name. In the public courts. So he's talking about things that are horrible to happen to you in the Roman government. This is a wretched thing for your name to be ruined in the the public courts. Wretched too is a monetary fine. Exacted from one's property. And wretched is exile. 
So he's mentioning some of the most horrible punishments that could happen to you in Rome. That your name is ruined. That there's some fine placed on you. That you're exiled. These are all wretched things. Then he says, but still in each calamity there is retained some trace of liberty. Even if death is set before us, we may die in freedom. But the executioner, the veiling of the heads, and the very word cross. Let them all be removed very far from not only the Roman's body, but also the Roman citizen's thoughts, eyes, and ears. He's not even speaking of a physical cross. He's saying that the word cross is so vulgar, is so degrading to a Roman citizen, that word should not ever even been, be spoken in their presence. That word should never even cross their mind. I was trying to find it earlier before the service, and I couldn't find it. But one, during the time, about 100 years after Jesus is crucified, you have a, a Christian whose name is Justin Martyr. One of the lasting, they call it a graffiti. It's a, it's a carving in a, ro in, in, a, in a rock surface. But one of the only lasting graffitis from this time is related to Christianity. It is an emblem of a cross with a donkey on it. And this is how they thought of the cross. So why the cross? The cross was an emblem of foolishness and suffering, vulgarity. It was despicable that a Roman citizen would die on a cross. Then Jesus says this. This is all during Jesus' time. This didn't come about after they crucified Jesus. This is while he's living on earth. Jesus says this, Matthew 16, 24. Then said Jesus to his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. They all were well aware of what he's saying. This is why sometimes there's, we miss these things. There's so much shock when the disciples would hear Jesus say things like this. Like, why are you asking us to do something? Because there's a cost that comes with a kingdom. Everything in life is an exchange. Everything in life is an exchange. You will exchange something for something. And that's what's going on in these accounts. Jesus is asking the rich young ruler. Jesus is asking me. Jesus is asking you, will you make the exchange? Will you make the exchange? He was willing to do it. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He was willing to bear the most humiliating emblem and the most vulgar death of that time because he was willing to make the exchange of this humiliation for this thing called the church. And before he even does it, He's pushing against the idea that the disciples have of this kingdom of the Messiah that's going to just break in and it's going to overthrow the Romans. And they were so far off of what God wanted to do. Unless we get raised up in our hubris, how many things in the Bible are we so far off of where God is looking at us and he's saying that's not how it's going to happen. But we're so stuck in a single mindset. That's what the Jews did. They were so stuck in that the Messiah had to be a warrior king and that the Messiah had to be a great man, that the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. Yes, we know. But that the Messiah would ultimately overthrow the Romans and establish the kingdom right there. That's what the disciples were looking for. And Jesus is telling them, no, that's not how we're going to purchase this kingdom. We're going to purchase this kingdom when you take up your cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited? 
If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Will you make the exchange? Are you willing to pay that price? That's what he's asking the disciples. That's what he's asking us when we read that. Are you willing to exchange? The rich young ruler couldn't do it. And unfortunately, even today, there's some people that love God. They don't love God enough. And so when the time comes, they don't make that exchange. And they go away sorrowful. And you talk to them. And they never have a bad thing to say about the church. They never have an evil thing to say about God. It's not because they didn't love God. It's because they loved something more than God. The musicians would come. Several weeks ago, I was listening to Pastor Robbie Mitchell preach. And this story that he told, it's, well, I should say this account that he told came back to me this afternoon in, in praying and seeking God's face. And so I began to research it and reread the account this afternoon. The account is of 26 martyrs. You don't hear a lot about martyrs in today's world, in the nation we live in. But there are still on average over three, it's some kind of weird number because it's like 3.4 and we don't think of people as 0.4, but that's just how it divides up. Over the course of a year, there's roughly three Christians that die every day for their faith. We don't think of that because we are blessed beyond imagination. And we live in a place where we've never even seriously had to consider that thought. We consider it like when we read these accounts. We consider it sometimes when we're brought to places of great consecration. When we give up things of great value, people give up homes. People give up futures. People change whole destinies and whole life plans in great acts of consecration. But in this nation, thank God, we don't have to be afraid of someone executing us simply because we worship Jesus. But in many places across the world, they still go through that. Japan now doesn't face that. But in the year 1597, it was not as free as it is now. The ruling man had made a decree that it was outlawed to be a Christian. You have missionaries that were in the nation. They were there under the fear of death, knowing that if they were caught preaching the gospel, preaching God's word, they would be executed. 26 men and boys were caught. And the man that was ruling decided to make an example of them to all the other Christians. And so he decided because they worshipped a cross, he would crucify them. And so 26 crosses were made. The youngest person to be crucified, varying accounts, but the youngest person to be crucified was either 12 or 13. Each cross was made to the height of the person being crucified. It was a custom-made cross. And when these 26 individuals were brought to look at their crosses, 
Each of them was taken to their cross, and in turn, they knelt down and embraced their own cross. The youngest of them, in some accounts he's 12, in some accounts he's 13. The youngest boy to be crucified, whether he was 12 or 13, he was given an opportunity. He was told, you don't have to die today. All you have to do is denounce this faith. All you have to do is say that you don't want to be a part of this anymore. And the young man looked at the executioners, and his reply is recorded in history, is how could I deny my Savior? Take me to my cross. Barely a teenager. He walked to his cross, and he asked them, is this one mine? They said, yes, this one's yours. And he knelt down and thanked God that he was counted worthy to be crucified for Jesus. Now I know that that is, it is a moving story. But this was my question again this afternoon. It was my question the first time I heard this story. And it was my question again this afternoon as it came back to my mind. God, I may have to face that one day. We all may have to face that one day. And if we do have to face that, I believe God will give us the strength to overcome that. I think that's a, one of the deeper one of the deeper understandings of when the Apostle Paul said, I have learned whatsoever state I am in therewith to be content. Also, he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. When you read what he said right there, he's talking about living in suffering and going through times when he had nothing and going through times of great turmoil. And then there were other times where he had abundance. And then he makes the statement, I can do all things things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I believe with all my heart, if there's a day, God forbid, but if there is a day in this nation when we face martyrdom, those of us that are willing to stand up for Christ, He will give us the power to walk through that when we get there. That's the only way you can walk through that. But more than likely, many of us will never face that. And so this is the question for all of us tonight. In closing. God. I'll, prever, I'll probably never really be crucified. So what does my cross look like? Because we can't be a Christian. If we don't bear the cross. That's what he said. If any man will be my disciple. I understand that. I really I wanted to preach something super exciting. Because I love Sunday nights. And I want them to be exciting. In fact, I really hoped that this service would just blow up and you all would just shout. But you all missed your chance. And so maybe tonight is just some questions that we need to think about long and hard. What is my cross? Am I bearing it? Am I making the purchase? Am I making the exchange? Am I willing to give up my kingdom for his kingdom? Am I willing to make that? And what does that look like, God? If I'm never crucified, how do I bear my cross? My cross is going to look different than your cross. That's one of the fascinating things about that story. Every cross, 26 of them, every single one of them looked different. Because they were made for the person who would be crucified on it. It's a horrible story. It's a moving story. That young man, his mom stood in front of him and watched him crucified. And she couldn't say anything because to say anything would give away all the other Christians that were there. You can read it. It's not hard to find the account. They sang hymns and prayed for one another. As they all slipped off into eternity. If we could stand, Paul says this. If 
For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Paul, of all people, knew what he was about to say. He was a Roman. He was a Roman. He knew the hatred of the cross. He knew how disgusting it was to the Roman mind. And yet he says, the Jews, they require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I know we're not going crazy and rearranging the chairs tonight as much as I wanted to. But I think God is asking us in this house tonight, am I bearing my cross? You don't hear a lot about the cross in Pentecost anymore. Especially in nations like the United States and several others where we're blessed beyond imagination. We really are kind of spoiled. But Christianity still requires a cross. And there's no other way around it. If any man will be his disciple, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow after him. So for just a few minutes tonight, this question's going to take longer than just tonight to answer probably. But why don't we start tonight? Why don't we all gather around the front? And let's ask ourselves, am I bearing my cross have I denied myself?
some ways, all of our crosses will look the same. But in many ways, they'll be different. And you'll bear things that I won't bear. And I'll bear things that you won't bear. And to be honest with you, I don't understand all of why God designed it this way. But this is the way he designed it. So I believe that I am in a group of people that have just made up their minds. However I bear my cross, God, I'll bear my cross because I want to see Him. I think that's the only way that a 13-year-old could look at one of the most horrible deaths that you could go through and say, I'll go through it. That's what Jesus did. He knew the joy that was on the other side, that's what the Bible says. So he endured the cross, despising the shame of it. And if he can do it, we can do it. If he can do it, you can do it. I know. Probably should have said this before altar call, but one of the most beautiful things happens in the crucifixion. I believe it's very clear. It is a very clear message to us. There comes a point when even Jesus couldn't bear his cross. And he falls under the weight of it. And someone else comes alongside and helps him bear his cross. And I truly believe that in that, God is saying that there's going to be times when you can no longer bear that cross. And so he is going to come alongside you and help you pick that cross up and carry it all the way to glory. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for that promise. Why don't we stand tonight? Please remember, we have prayer tomorrow night at 6.30, discipleship class, the pastor's course. We have midweek word in action right here Tuesday night. But before we go, we need some people that will fast tomorrow. We need some people that can fast Tuesday. Some people that will fast Wednesday. Thank you. Some people that will fast Thursday. Thank you very much. Some people that will fast Friday. Thank you. Some people that will fast Saturday. Thank you. This kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. So, I know it's a little bit more somber tonight. But I believe if we get this right, we'll make it. We will be his disciples. So, remember everything going on this week. On your way out, grab some church cards. Let's continue to invite our neighbors, our friends, and our family continue to be a part of what God is doing in Pueblo. God bless you. Love one another. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.